Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're just going to begin our study here, finishing off Jephthah, uh, though it's going to take probably a little bit. We might not get it all done today. Uh, but before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the studies that we have each morning and for this morning, uh, for the rest that we had last night. And uh, we ask for clear uh, minds and an understanding heart that you can give us wisdom and light for the present. We ask for your strength and power in our lives and we pray for those who are searching for truth, um, those that um, for various reasons have, um, even though they may have rejected light or had problems in the past that they are still searching and we just pray uh, for those that are on the periphery of this movement and even those within it who have had their doubts and struggles. We just pray that you can help them uh, be with us now in this study. Help us to correct any errors we may have in our understanding. And may we reflect your character to all that we come in contact. We pray and ask in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> so this is where we finished off. Yesterday, except I, I changed a couple of things. So you will see when we look at the verses themselves. So what I changed is I put uh, December 6th as uh, Judges 12, which verse 1 to 7, which we haven't put on this line yet. So I just put it on there because I believe that that's where we're going to find that final way mark, the revo rem uh, the arrival of the third message. And then you can see that span of six years. Well, from 2014 to 2020 is six years. And that happens to be the number of years that Jephthah reigns. So we will look at that. So, so what we've done with Jephthah, Jephthah is, is rather interesting uh, because Jephthah represents um, the symbolic use of time in this movement. Now, it, when we go back here to uh, these other lines, such as the judge's line, we look at Jephthah, and it's December 6, 2020, on this line of the judges. And um, it's the formalization of a message, that message that arrived. That is the July 18, 2020 message. And we can see how then Jephthah, as this symbolic use, use of dates is um, it's something that we had prior to July 18, but there's something about what happens in the rejection of that symbolic use of numbers that becomes a formalization of the arrival of the second message on this line. And that is the second message. If we think about this line, judges line, so ignore Jotham down there. If we just think about the judges line here, um, and ignore Jotham's line, though Jotham is in there, right? He's in our line. But just the judges line itself, and it had this period of darkness, and this was about the lack of understanding of the lines themselves. That is, prior to 9-11, we, we had an understanding of the lines about a repeat of history that didn't include... 9-11, um, and that is we didn't understand Revelation 9, the third woe, and how it applies to our time. We had applied it to 1989. And so here we have this, this line that has this increase of light, and that increase of light in this formalization is going to be related to 9-11. But this is going to be formalized in this period of time that we say is uh, 2018, October 13th, 2018, to September 9th, 2019. And that is in that history from 9-11. All of these things are happening in this movement, but they all come to the fore with this conflict with Parminder's message. That's what, that's what happens in this movement. And, and that's what the judge's line is showing. 
So we know that this judge's line isn't this big line, that this, that this is a zoom into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel. That is, everything that, that we first learned about 9-11 was that, that it was the empowerment of the first angel's message. And, and that's how this movement operated. But in that interim time from 9-11 to 11-9, which is going to be the empowerment of this line, that, that we've somehow zoomed into our history in this arrival of the second angel's message. That is, in order to understand the arrival of the second angel's message in our history, it's not just about Islam, though Islam is a part of that, because Islam is 9-11, but that's the empowerment of the first angel's message. This is now the second angel's message. And the second angel's message is what? What is the second angel's message, especially as applied to Revelation 18? A fourth angel joins with the third, joins with all the angels, really, and proclaims the fall, fall of Babylon. It's the call to come out of Babylon. Right. Yeah, and the reasons why. Yeah, so so Babylon has fallen, has fallen. That's the second angel's message. That's in Millerite history. We have this fall of Babylon. That is, the Protestant churches experience a moral fall. The fall is not complete. And even though the Millerites made a call to come out of Babylon, that's actually misplaced because Revelation 18 doesn't occur in Millerite history. That's in our history. That's the Sunday law. Nellie White sees that off in the future. But we mark Revelation 18 at 9-11. And that's true. That is, 9-11 is the Sunday law. But when we apply Revelation 18 to 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel, we are making a similar error that the Millerites did when they applied the close of probation to August 11th, 1840, or even the arrival of the seventh angel, right? Because the seventh angel doesn't arrive until October 22, 1844. So they think the end of the second world is the, is the end of the sixth trumpet. And so that the seventh trumpet has begun to sound on August 11th, 1840, but it has it doesn't begin to sound until October 22, 1844. And so even within the Millerites themselves, when they look at the line, even though they don't understand the lines in the way that we do, but when they look at where they are, they're not clear of where they are. That is, they think they're farther along the line of prophecy than they actually are. And this movement has done the same things, right? That is, we thought things are clear closer than they really were. Now, so when we look at this second angel then, now, and we place it here in this judge's line as July 18, 2020, well, we know we can't possibly be on the line that Jeff had been talking about. That is, this judge's line is not the line of 9-11, uh, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. Right. So this is this is a zoom into a, a way mark on that line. But it's on that line when 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel, not when 9-11 is the empowerment of the first angel. It's the same event, but those two are tied together. Now, we can see how we have 9-11 there. But that 9-11 is relating to a line where 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel. That is, we have this line where 9-11, that Jeff has, where 9-11 is these two different waymarks. Right? But we know that he actually is looking at two different lines because we understand that now, that really 
that it's 11.9 that is 9.11 as the arrival of the second angel. So when we zoom into the arrival of the second angel, 9-11, September 11th, is the arrival of the first angel on this line that's zoomed into that way mark. So that means we're understanding in this judge's line a single way mark on this line that Jeff had before. And that way mark that we're understanding is September 11th as the arrival of the second angel. Does that make sense to people? Yes. And that means we're not to midnight on that line that Jeff has always had. So when you go back to, you know, I say always, really, it's the line that we have in 2016. We have 9-11 as the first day of the first month. We have... We have midnight, which is the fifth day of the fourth month. And, and we believe that we were approaching midnight, which we were. We just got confused about the way marks that we were in, thinking that, no, we've arrived at midnight, or we've arrived at midnight, or we've arrived at midnight. We kept thinking that we were arriving at midnight, or that this way mark that we were looking at right in front of us, like November 9th, that would be midnight, or midnight for some group, or something like that. So, so now we know when we look at this judge's line, we know what it is, that, and we know where we are. We're not to midnight on the line of Jeff. So we don't have midnight, this raffia on Jeff's line, and obviously paneum on Jeff's line, and the Sunday law on Jeff's line. Those things have not happened. All that we've done is the second angel has arrived. Now, that might be a bit discouraging in the sense that, well, we thought we were a lot farther along than we were. But we should be able to see by the condition of this movement and what has happened historically with this movement that all of these things were necessary for us to learn some things. And we may not like to have to learn the things that we're learning. Because, you know, we're Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists have been around for a long time looking for the second coming of Christ. And God has been giving light to this movement because the church rejected the light. Right In this repeat of history, the Seventh-day Adventist church was no different than the Protestants in the Protestants' reaction to uh Miller's message. They end up rejecting it. And so we have these things that are happening in the world. We have the fall of the Soviet Union. We have the attack on the World Trade Center by Islam. And these are ignored by the Seventh-day Adventist Church as, as, as having any prophetic significance. And so the Seventh-day Adventist Church is passed by. And instead, you know, we have Jeff Pippinger, who God gives light to. And um, so we have this, this movement that rises, and, and quite gradually. And there's all kinds of movements, all kinds of voices clamoring for the attention of Seventh-day Adventists. And many of these movements have bits of truth, but are full of error. Now, Jeff's movement... Even though there's things he doesn't understand, it's not truth mixed with error. It's an unfolding of light in a progressive manner. Jeff is not wrong when, because he doesn't understand the lines fully. Right? We can't say, well, well Jeff didn't understand about 9-11, so what he was teaching was there. No, it's just 9-11 had to happen. We had to actually go through fulfilled prophecy so that we could understand it. We have to have light for our feet. We have to walk along this path. Jeff had to do that. And then this movement joined him in doing that. And so for us to understand these things, it takes time. 
so when we look at this uh, line here of Jephthah, you know, this is on that judge's line. This is December 6th, 2020. It's it's a formalization of this message regarding um, time in a particular way. That is, it's something that this movement has to have, right? Because we have this line. We have all of this light that's happening in regard to the arrival of the second angel. And for the second angel to be fully arrived... This movement has to go through this experience, right? And it's leading us up to at least 2023, right? That's what the judge's line does. It, it hints at stuff in the future because it witnesses to this April 5th, 2030 date. But it seems like this is a time that's given us to accomplish a work. So... So our mission is being laid out as we go through these lines. And so we know that, that we're going to have this December 6th date on this line, but this is leading us up to the present time you know, on the line of the judges. So, so this is a, addressing light that um, is rejected on December 6th, 2020, but the rejection of that light becomes an arrival of a third message for this movement. Now, now, how can that be? How can the rejection of all of this light that comes from Jephthah, how can that be the arrival of a third message? I agree with Angela. We should be thankful for what God's doing in pruning and all the things that happen to a tree so that it can bear fruit. Okay. But so can December you 6th, your question. So the, the question is December 6, 2020 is a rejection of the message of Jephthah, right? Of the symbolic use of dates and um, all of the chronological things that led to July 18, 2020. December 6, 2020 is going to be this declaration is going to occur there. But we say the third angel arrives. So we're going to look at that, what that third angel is, because even though the line of Jephthah is December 6th, 2020, on the line of the judges, which is the formalization of a message, on this line, once we zoom into Jephthah, there is a third angel arriving. That is, Jephthah accomplishes something that then is going to occur on the line of the judges. And so we need to know what that is. And that we're going to see in, and as you saw there, see there, I put Judges 12, verse 1 to 7. So Judges 12, verse 1 to 7, is the arrival of the third angel in the story of Jephthah. So that's going to be the next chapter. But it's going to be this conflict with Ephraim. And, and so, so we've gone through this before, but we're going to look at it again and see how this fits into this way mark, how it fits with December 6th, 2020. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passedest thou to fight, passedest over, passedest thou over, to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. So we've had the men of Ephraim before, right? And, and the men of Ephraim always seem to be complaining that they're not invited to stuff. Right? They're not invited to these battles. Are they invited? Uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly, they are. Yeah, they are. So why do they think they're not invited? Or why do they say they're not invited? Because they might actually know that they've been invited. Why do they say they've not been invited?
They were seeking more of their own glory rather than the glory that would be to God. Yeah. Um, Loran says historical revisionists, which is a good observation as well. But I would think that the thing is they want the glory without the work. Somebody, somebody accomplishes something and they're like, well, well, you can't do that without me. You know, you should have included me. So, so the men of Ephraim, um, it says they gathered themselves together and went northward, right? Because they're in this northward where, where, why are they going northward? Because that's where the battle is, right? Yes. Okay. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. Okay. He did call them, right? And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come up unto me this day to fight against me? Now, I really think that this applies to uh, the conflicts that, that I personally had with FFA. They're basically, why are you going ahead and doing these things without us? It's almost like you need our approval. And yet, all along the way, I'm seeking to work with them in studying. I'm submissive. I'm not like a, a rogue element. You know, I'm just studying, studying their studies, um, presenting whatever they ask me to present, um, and, and have no expectation that they should be treating me the way that they were treating me, especially in 2018, but, but all through, you know, there's this, this, this problem in, in me presenting things because I present things that they don't expect. I'm going to a battle that they, that they're not interested in, but then this light comes and, and we could see it's important. And so they want to take credit for it, so to speak. But remember, you know, all along, Jephthah is being rejected. But this group of people here is different than the one that thrust him out. Right? I mean, this is Ephraim. They didn't thrust him out. It's going to be the, the sons of, of Gilead, right, who thrust him out. But then ask him back. So, so this can't just be FFA. Right. I mean, this this would include that, but um, so we're we're not sure yet who the men of Ephraim are in in this context, but but it is uh, dealing with FFA, but it's it's dealing with a bigger part of the movement. Okay, so then he says uh, then. Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. So we saw this same type of thing with uh, Gideon, right? But now we're going to actually have a battle. So what was the first time that Ephraim complained? So what, what's the history of Ephraim here in regard to being called? When you go back to Judges 8, 1, it says, And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus that thou callest us not when thou wentest to fight with, 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 with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. 
Okay, so that's going to be uh, Judges 8-1. That's going to be Gideon, right? Right, in the story of Gideon. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, when, when else do we see Ephraim? Uh, Judges 7.24, and Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, come down against them, the Midianites, take them before the water, take them before them, the waters, etc. Okay. Okay, and uh, let me see here. Arban Zeed. Okay, so let me see here. I'm trying to find this. Um, so we have them. I thought there was an, I'm trying to find the other place because there's three places. So what are the three places where we deal with Ephraim complaining? Anybody remember? Because we got we got there in the story of Gideon. Is it in the story of Abimelech? Um, I can't remember. Somebody's going to have to figure that out. Because there's three times. But anyway, when we go here, um, in this conflict, they're going to have this. Um, uh, it's, okay, so Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, you Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassehites. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, art thou an Ephraimite? And if he said, nay, then say they unto him, say now Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 42, that 40 and 2,000. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah, the Gileadite, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. So <clears throat> we have this, um, this story with the Shibboleth. Now, what did we say the Shibboleth was? They can't frame it right. What's the problem? Okay, predictions. So is that, so the problem is predictions. What do you mean by that, Iran? Why don't we define a prediction? Okay. Define a prediction. I mean, isn't isn't this with a prediction seeking 
to reveal something before it happens. In a type of, let's say, prophetic manner. Okay. Well, one of the things about, okay, so we know that this is about the Sunday law, right? I think we've established that. It, and it's the arrival of the third angel. So it's, it's, it's saying something about the Sunday law. And we have a group of people that has that is not able to frame the word correctly. It is they don't understand the word. Right? They they can't pronounce it. They can't frame it right. Frame to pronounce it right. And and this word here. Uh, Right. So it's the use of symbols, right? They're, they're not they're not able to understand this uh, use of symbols. Now, this this idea of frame means properly to erect, hence causatively to set up a great variety of applications, whether literal, establish, fix, prepare, apply, or figurative, a point, render, sure, proper, or prosperous. Um so they're not able to, and it also includes the word tarry, um, but make provision, get ready, set right. Um, and then this word pronounce, the bar, it just means to speak, right? It's, the, it's often, uh, uh, you know, it's just, just the word having to do with uh, pronouncing, rehearsing, saying, speaking, right? So it just means, but it's properly to arrange, that is, um, so if you think about this frame to set up and arrange, and then, of course, this word right can um, set upright, right? So, so this is about getting things correctly, getting things right, getting the lines correct. And, and so the Ephraimites can't do that. They can't set up the lines. They don't understand the message. And so, you know, they're going to be killed, not literally, right? Talking figuratively here. And, and so during this time, you know, in this line of Jephthah, you know, Jephthah is doing this work of, of setting up the lines using chronology, using symbols. And then there's this conflict with the, the children of Ephraim, the sons of Ephraim, right? The men of Ephraim. And they're like, you know, you didn't invite us to this battle. You know, wh why didn't you call us? Well, they were called. Right, just as they always are. So, so they don't understand this message. Now, this is going to lead us to Judges twelve seven, right? And Judges twelve seven is significant because it's twelve seven. So twelve seven is on the eighteen forty three chart. Twelve times seven is eighty four. It's a symbol of um, July 21st, right? It's got all of these. It's basically the midst of the week, right, as a symbol. It relates to the metonic cycle, 12 uh, common years and, and seven embolismic years make up the 19 year of the metonic cycle. It is all this, this, this stuff dealing with prophecy. And you could also see Judges 12, 6. You got the 126. And that's where they can't frame to pronounce it right. That's where it says, you know, say unto them, shibboleth. And they can't. They just say sibboleth. So, so this becomes, so we need to be able to understand these patterns. If we're going to make predictions. Now, what I have said, whether this is correct or not, 
is that when we look at December 6, 2020, there's two things about it. One is it's a reiteration of Parminder's errors in their rejection of symbols. But we also know that many people in this movement exist who, who have the same sentiments that uh, they agree with the December 6, 2020 declaration, but they're still in the movement. Now, why is that? Why, why did they not go with them? Why are they still here? Okay, so Iran's asking a question. Is that the end of 465 days? What's this about? Can you explain the question, Iran? I just thought I remember 465 days connected with that. Hmm. Well, you're going to have to look into that because I don't remember... Okay. Is, but um, but anyway, we have the December 6, 2020 declaration. Now, they, they basically shut us out. But we say it's the arrival of the third angel's message. Um, so that there's something that happens in this movement because of December 6, 2020, that now we could say is this third angel arrives. So one of the things we know, just like October 22, 1844, that becomes the end of the Millerite movement. And since December 6, 2020, because we don't have the fourth angel on here. But there would be, but that's not that important here in understanding this line. But what we're going to see is that there is a disappointment. Right. Um. And this December 6th, you can also see that's 12 6, right? So, I mean, you could almost just say it's, you know, we could just do this if we really wanted to. So maybe we could, since we want to, at least I do. We can just say that judge is 12 6, right? Because that's the shibboleth. Right. Yes. Okay. So that that division occurs between the 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 men of Ephraim and 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 uh, Jephthah, right? So that's the rejection of Jephthah <clears throat> by the men of Ephraim. So that's December six. It's twelve six. But we know that there's a number of seven attached to it, right? That is 12, seven. And um, we can see that there's six years, it says, that six years that Jephthah judges Israel. Right? We can see that's the six, six years. I mean, symbolically, the six years is this story of Jephthah up to this rejection. Of course, in, in Judges 12, that's going to be just you know, he, he has this period of time starting, but we're just saying it's symbolically representational of this six years that we had placed on this line without considering the six years at all. So when we wrote June 22nd, 2014, we weren't um, thinking, okay, we need to choose that because we're ending on 2020 and we need six years. We just noted after the fact that it is six years. Um. So what happens after December 6th is basically a formation of, well, the movement is now, of course, shattered, right, into these three different groups, um, at least, right, because you have the American group and the Canadian group, and they have different interests um, for the most part, even though they, they work together and had uh, been working together. Um, well, I guess they don't really. When did they start actually having meetings together? I'm trying to remember that was. That's going to be after December 6th. 
because before we were just looking at the meetings coming out of FFA. So, so it's going to be some time after that. I don't remember how long. But, you know, the Canadian group, you know, starts doing its meetings on Sabbath and then the American group. And then they would just decide to work together, switch Sabbaths. But, but there's definitely a different characteristic. So uh, re rejecting Jephthah, so Angela's making this note here um, about Jephthah, that is his name means he will open. Now, of course, this is the opening of the eyes, but, but what else is opened up in this history from June, te June 22nd, 2014 to December 6th, 2020? What is opened up? Because, yeah, it's about opening his eyes. He will open. But I think it's more about opening up a seal. Okay. And then Iran says the 465 started August 29th, 2019, parallel to the 46500 that ended on February 27th, 2016. So that has to do um, uh, February 27th, 2016. That's going to be um, dealing dealing with Parminder, right? Parminder's ordination, is that February 27th, 2016, Iran? Yes. Okay, so, and that's gonna be the numbering of the children of, because um, Zebulun is gonna be used and this is gonna be the tribe, which tribe? I'm not remembering. It was from one of your charts. Yeah, I know. I'm just going to find the chart here. Oops. You know, it's, we got Zebulun. That was, um, yeah, it's going to be Naphtali, wasn't it? No. It's not, not Naphtali. It's not that one. So here, I'll just put the number in. I'll search that. So the number is... It's, it's right it's right there in the bottom oh there it is yeah yeah so this is going to be yeah this is the one i was thinking of parminder's ordination forty six thousand five hundred days and then uh, we have the 1279 to parminder's rebellion and then we have uh august 29th 2019 and then there's 465 days so it it uh, relates to parminder Right. That was the idea. OK, thanks for that. Um, so the idea here is that we can see the connection between December 6, 2020 and Parm Parminder's Rebellion. Right. This 465 days, which is a, is which 40, 46,500 from the last day of the General Conference in 1888 which of course is gonna to relate to Parminder's prediction regarding the Sunday law connected to 1888 to 2014, that's gonna start this line, right? And then, uh, then we're gonna have December 6, 2020, and that's going to end this line. And that's gonna be connected to Parminder's rebellion. So, so this, um, this movement then splits into these, well, we'll call them factions, but just different ways in which we're approaching things. Now, my view, this is just a, an oversimplification, is that um, the American group is generally seeking to be uh, conservative Adventists who are a bit more conservative in the sense of they're not interested in speculative ideas as much, though they do have a lot of the characteristics that we see within uh, conservative Adventists, such as belief in conspiracy theories and things like that. Um, and if we're going to say, you know, Daniel Fontenot is sort of an example of this, it's sort of this um, founded on, you know, looking at the Catholic Church and what it's doing, 
um, you know, the Sunday law, we, we got to worry about the papacy, all of these standard things that conservative Adventists would talk about. The Canadian group is a little more speculative. Now, you know, in some ways you can say they're fairly similar, but, but it's a different group of people who have different interests. They have some interests, of course, that overlap quite a bit. They're not at odds with each other so much, though I know there are some people in the American group that don't like some of the people in the Canadian group and vice versa. There's differences of views and opinions and personalities, but, but they tend to work together. And then there's the group that we have here that's been studying every day, right? So our group is, we're, we're cautious, so we're conservative as well in that sense. But we've spent the time to examine the foundation more closely and to understand the lines, where we are in these lines. And we are seeking to, to correct ourselves, not to just believe that we are right and that we're correcting others. So, so we think that we have to correct ourselves. Um, so there's, there's these differences within these groups. And, and if we look at Millerite history, we can see that what happened after October 22, 1844 is sort of being worked out in this movement. And we look at early writings, page 74, what Ellen White says about that. And, and we can see that we need to take that counsel, understanding it symbolically, and apply it to this movement at the present time. And there's a number of things in there in early writing 74. You know, the daily, the pioneers had the correct view on the daily. So obviously it's not about the daily in our history. We'd have to look at what's a parallel to the daily. So what's a parallel to the daily? When we studied, when we examined the foundation, we actually made this quite clear what the parallel to the daily was. So the pioneer view of the daily was what? Paganism. Paganism. Okay. Well, that would there would be more to it than that. And 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 when I say that, I mean it's not just what they said it was. The question is, what is it, right? What is its implications? What is it they're trying to say by their view of the daily? Because Ellen White's going to reiterate the view of the daily in the Great Controversy um, where she deals with Second Thessalonians, and she's not going to mention the daily once, but she's going to be giving the pioneer view of the daily. So what is the pioneer view of the daily? What does it relate to? Well, um, as we were studying the daily, I think the daily turned out to be um, the what happened during Christ times that lost we lost the um, you know the sacrifices those things that went on in the in the um, in the sanctuary those type the all them sacrifices that was just kind of taken all away when Rome came in and and well killed Christ and and then uh, destroyed uh, okay um, so you have so you have the pagan persecution it's a counterfeit system Paganism is a counterfeit system of worship. It's counterfeit yes. earthly sanctuary, right? And then we know that the abomination of desolation is, of course, uh, a counterfeit of Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, not the earthly. And, and when the conflict in the daily occurred in the early 1900s, um, they believed that they were trying to um, apply what they had learned about the sanctuary. That is, they're looking back at, okay, we had this understanding about 
Daniel chapter 8. But we now, when we understood Daniel chapter 8 in the past, we thought the earth was the sanctuary, right? This is the way they're thinking. But now we know that, that the sanctuary is in heaven. And so then uh, they had to have tried to usurp the heavenly sanctuary, right? Because we thought it was about the earth, but now this is about heaven. This is actually how the thinking goes. It's, it's, it's not, not really well understood, I think, in this movement, why um, these people came to their, the new view of the daily. Because in their mind, they were, they were trying to do something that was right. But of course, they didn't really understand the pioneer view. That is, the pioneer view did need some corrections. That is, there were things about the verses themselves that they didn't fully understand in Daniel chapter 8. Miller didn't understand, right? So when he looked at the takeaway, he didn't realize it was two different Hebrew words. Uh, room and sir, right? So he didn't know. He didn't know that actually what's happening in chapter eight is different than what's happening in chapter uh, eleven, verse thirty-one, and twelve, verse eleven, right? So Miller didn't realize that these are two different things. Because one was really about setting up, it wasn't really about removing. It was lifting up and exalting the daily in chapter eight. But the other one is actually taking away, right, and replacing it with the abomination of desolation. The other one is about paganism being lifted up within the abomination of desolation, within Rome. So, so we have these two desolating powers. And Ellen White says the pioneers, um, we we're all united in the correct view of the daily. So that still hasn't really answered what the daily is as far as a view, what it, what it is representing in our time. So if we look at it, what the daily means in the context of early writing 74, what does it mean that the pioneers were all united on the correct view of the daily? Because she talks about the correct view of the daily, we know that they didn't understand everything correctly regarding the proofs of what the daily was. But yet they were all united upon the correct view, even though that view was incomplete. It had some problems with it that needed to be corrected. And this, this is why the problem that happened in, you know, the new view of the daily, because Ellen White wasn't going to say, well, everything the pioneers said about the daily was 100% correct, because that's not what she meant in early writings, page 74. Because it wasn't true that everything they said about the daily was correct. But there is a correct view of the daily. So what does that represent? in our time. Okay, we have a foundational message. If Miller had had the wrong view of the daily, the incorrect view, would he have come to October, or not, would he have come to the 2300 days ending in 1843, about the year 1843? Would he have come to that conclusion with a, an incorrect view of the daily? I don't think so. No, he couldn't have, right? Because the only reason he could come to 1843 from the book of Daniel was because he understood something. And we, st we still haven't actually said what he understood that was necessary for him to come to the 2300 days, which they would have been united on in the correct view of the daily.
what's correct about the view of the daily that the pioneers had that leads to the understanding of the 2300 days that if they didn't have they wouldn't have come to the understanding of the 2300 days uh, i'm not sure what you're what you're asking but could it have okay. been rome no so it has to do with the start of the 2300 days If Miller had understood that the daily was a tie kiss epiphanies, right? If he had understood the view that, um, that this is going to be dealing with the earthly sanctuary being defiled, would he have started the 2300 days in 457 BC? Because where most people apply the 2300 days is they take this, and, and I've looked at this in detail. Um, they try to. No, no he yeah. wouldn't. What's that? No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't under. He wouldn't uh, calculate the box. <clears throat> okay, I didn't hear what you said, so it's not going to help me too much. I said he didn't calculate it right if he went from antithesis to whatever his name is. Okay, so, so his calculation would have started later. He wouldn't have started in 457 BC. Because that's right. The daily is supposed to be the desolation of the earthly sanctuary by Tychus Epiphanes in a period of 1150 days. Right, which is going to be um, three years and um, three years and about 50, 54 days. Right, so three years and 54 days that um, the temple is desecrated before it's going to be cleansed, right? So Tychus Epiphanes defiles the temple, right? So the new view of the daily is, well, this is about the heavenly sanctuary being defiled, right? And it's going to be done by the abomination of desolation, right? So instead of the earthly sanctuary being defiled by Tychus Epiphanes, we got this 2,300 years that the heavenly sanctuary is defiled. Well, if that's the case, would you have started in 457 BC before Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary began? You wouldn't do that, would you? No, you wouldn't. Right. So, so the the pioneer view of the daily, the the, the simple thing about it is, it has to do with the basic prophecy that they're using to come to October 22, 1844, ultimately, right? That is, he understands that, Miller understands, that the 2300 days is going to start in the time of paganism. More specifically, it's going to start in the time of the kingdom in Daniel chapter 8 that is first introduced. That's going to be Medo-Persia. So the 2300 days is going to start in the time of Medo-Persia. And it's going to continue during this, this period of paganism. It's going to continue until the end of paganism. Right? Paganism is going to be taken out of the way. And then there's going to be 30 more years attached to that. Mm. Right? And then you're going to have 1260 years of the abomination of desolation. So paganism has to be taken out of the way. And then the abomination of desolation set up. And that's going to end at the same time as the 2300 years. So, or, or in that period, right? At the start of that period, that's marking the time of the end. So, so if we're going to try to take an analog of that, 
And we're going to say that this relates to our history. We're going to have to say that this, this relates to some fundamental truth that we understand that um, is ultimately going to be rejected. So we're all united in order to come to the July 18, 2020 prediction. I mean, we must be united on something. So on December 6, 2020, the arrival of the third angel's message here, um, that is going to be a rejection of that message. So what's the analog to the date, the correct view of the daily? Um. I'm thinking maybe the the symbology of it that they weren't using it like we were at that point or and now the use of numbers um okay well the symbolic use of dates but but there there's got to be something more to it than that because I mean that's what this whole line is about is the symbolic use of dates and numbers <clears throat> it needs to be a more fundamental than that So, so what's the primary verse that that this movement is founded on? Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Yes. Okay. So this is about the Sunday law. Now, when we look at it, it's really about the lines, right? Yes. That is, this movement, when Jeff starts looking at Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, he starts to understand line upon line. Because he can, yes. he can have two times of the ends, 1798 and 1989. He can see them in that verse. Yeah, part A and part B, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So when we look at what the analysis that Odilio has done and the analysis that Colin has done, and some people will sometimes think this is sort of a, an unfair perspective or view. Um, but the thing that I th see them missing is the overall understanding of the lines. That is, they've rejected some fundamental aspects of the lines that united us at one point, but have been set aside. You know, one of the things you can see with what we're doing is we're, we're laying out these lines in this way. Do you see Odilio or Colin laying out the lines like this? No. Absolutely not. They haven't, right? They've there's this this bit of information that was was absolutely necessary to come to 1843. You know, to the end of the Jewish year 1843 that Miller had this understanding of the daily, and they were all united in that. Now, Ellen White says other views of the daily are going to be. Um, applied and this this is very controversial within adventism because people have different ideas about what she means there what were these other views of the daily but part of that it has to do with, with the literalistic aspect of the sanctuary and, and and you can see if you have this literalistic view of the daily That's, that's what's happening in, in 1850. That's why you have people going to Old Jerusalem. Part of this understanding of the daily had to do with going back to the Atticus Epiphanes view, not necessarily literally, but the idea that the Jews themselves 
have to be restored, right? So that, that's part of what's happening there. So here, when we're looking at this, we're, we're in the present time, we're losing sight of these lines because these lines guide us. Now, one of the things that happened in one of the conflicts that I had with some people from the Canadian group had to do with this idea that, um, that when I was laying out the lines, they were saying that all that matters is the third angel's message. And of course, that would just be a rejection of the first and second angel's message. If you said all that matters is the third angel's message. Because you can't have a third without a first and second. But then they compared me to Tabo, saying that, well, Tabo said, you know, we have to believe the lines, right? And, and they, they made an analogy with him and the lines and me and chronology or something like that. But we need a correct understanding of the lines. Tabo wasn't teaching a correct understanding of the lines because he was teaching Parminder's understanding of the lines. It was the new view of the lines. And this movement has been affected by this new view of the lines, just like the new view of the daily. And there's different new views, right? In Millerite history, there's there's the view that is sort of literalistic, and then you get the spiritualistic views that happen. So you're going to have uh, all kinds of different views that are happening with time setting within the Adventist groups. Okay. And we see that happening here. So in our history, we had to go back to the foundation, see that it's laid correctly. And then we spent, you know, this is number 312 of understanding the lines. And we're starting to get to understand them. And we know yeah, that they're become they're coming into focus. Yeah, and we have to do this. This is line upon line, precept upon precept, setting in order on these lines, which are horizontal lines, these way marks, the plummet. Right? Those are the way marks. They're righteousness. We have this line of judgment. We're setting them in order. All of the dates on these lines. If we're just drawing dates on lines, but we don't have this structure of a line, we don't, we don't, because even our 777, we now can take that and create lines with it, right? From the different stories of the judges. Yes. So we can now see that all of these, all of our history that we've been drawing, all of these dates that we put into the future have always been a part of a line. That they're not just dates that are connected numerically. They're connected with this basic template that underlies them. Um, as an analogy, we're basically, we were groping in the dark with just put, you know, um, Oh, we see this, and when we see that, and then we see this, but we hadn't figured out the structuring. And and once we got the um, uh, the light of the sanctuary or the sanctuary light, which is the lamp, it, it started coming into a, a clearer focus, and we could start laying these lines out in the same pattern over and over again. And now we're, we're, we're even seeing how these things relate, especially here in Judges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, things that we did. So after December 6, 2020, I mean, we're going to look at um, a number of different things. We're going to, I believe we end up reviewing the 2520. If I'm, I can't remember when we started that study. Um, that's going to be quite a bit later. Now, let me see. Where is this study? I'm just trying to find it here. So I have to go to my videos. And I got a lot of videos. Um, really? <laughs> that, you know, three years of videos on a daily basis. So it ends up being a lot of videos. 
So I'm going to go. I was thinking I was like counting like 500 so far. Over 500. Yeah, there's more than that. Um, yeah. Okay, so if I go to December. Okay, we did Ezekiel. That's what we're gonna. We were doing Ezekiel at the time that we had that division in the movement, right? That was that was our main study. And then we're gonna do Ezekiel, and then we're gonna do some uh, review of the twenty five twenty, and then we're gonna start examining the foundation. There's some other things in there, but but the point is, everything that we've been doing with this arrival of the first message has been what Ellen White and James White were told to do after October 22, 1844. That is, republish the work of the pioneers and, and study the light that has come from their experience, their disappointment. And from July 18th to December 6th, the movement overall isn't interested in that. Right? They're just going to reject July 18th. But when they shut us out on December 6th, Judges 12 6, and we have this test, this shibboleth, that this is, is understanding something about the Sunday law. Um, Right. So, so there's these predictions being made. You can now say just speculations or suggestions, however you want to put it. But we know that these are not correct. So who are the Ephraimites that can't frame to pronounce the, the word correctly? What does that mean? Well, didn't we equate the the Ephraimites falling or those forty two and five thousand to be in the end of FFA? Mm hmm. It's the end of FFA. So, would that would that? But it's more than it's more than just the end of FFA, though. Yeah, it's it's the end of FFA, and then. Um, then there's another movement that comes out of that. Okay. Because they, ha they had some understanding of, of what the others were rejecting. July 18th. Yeah. Okay. So the 42,000 represents, what do they represent? Well, we know it's a doubling of 21. Uh, it represents the 1260, the 42 months, right? Right. So so we're, we're connecting it here to December 6, 2020. So that's um, the 1260s right there, the 126. Um, we have uh, verse... Let me see here. Um, I'm just looking at it. Um, what I'd said before. Uh, what else is there? 21 represents midnight. Um, and we also connected this shibboleth with um, the flood. Right? Because because when they're when they, when they say shibboleth. The word shibboleth means a stream, also an ear of grain, a branch, right? But they say sibboleth, which is um, shibboleth is shibboleth, uh, sibboleth. So we got shibboleth. So let me get this correct. Is a flowing stream, 
and sibilet is an ear of grain or wheat. So they are related, right? Symbolically. No, but literally in the meanings of the words, they're related. Even though one's written with a samak and the other's with a shin, right? Now, I think they write it here with a shin in order to, uh, to just show the pronunciation difference. Because in Hebrew, at that time, they wouldn't have had the vowel pointings. They wouldn't have the dot above the shin. But... Um, but anyway, so, but these are related. One's an ear of grain, the other one's a flowing stream. They're related words. Um, and we're saying that this represents the Sunday law. The flowing stream is the Sunday law. I'm just trying to switch this here. So they're just trying to say, you know, say a stream, and they say sibilant, right, instead of the right word. And so there's going to be 40 and 2,000 slain. So, so we can look at the symbol of this number. So it's got a lot of symbols attached to it. But, um, what else can we say about this number, 42,000? Anything that we can say about it? Okay, so if you took 42,000 and you divided it by prophetic year, um, you get 1116.6666666, on and on. So I don't know if that's significant. If you did it by an actual Julian year, it'd be almost 11 and a half years. I don't know if that's significant. If we're going to take it as a span of time somewhere. What if you divided it by a metonic cycle? Okay. So if you took um, 42,000 divided by, what, 19, you're saying? That, that How many way. days are there in a metonic cycle? Okay. Well, um, well, a metonic cycle has... Uh, Uh, basically 6,939 or 40, depending on how you do it. So it's usually six, uh, 6,940. So 42,000 divided by 6,940. be six years or six. So that would represent the six years. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, six being the number of a man. Yeah. So it'd actually be, it's kind of interesting. It'd be exactly six metonic cycles and 360 days. Okay. That's pretty interesting. Right. So six metonic cycles and 360 days. So what does that, um, what does that mean?
because six mectonic cycles would that relate to this um, six years as a symbol? Very but also, likely. But also 360 as a symbol of the day for a year principle. There you go. Okay. So, so in this, so what is what is slaying this message? Because we're not we're not making this be people being slain, but this is a message. The men of Ephraim is a message, right? Of course, people can be attached to it, but it's about a message, and the message is a message that is not wanting to do the studying, but wants to have the glory, right? Exactly. Not willing to follow Miller, Miller's rules. Exactly. But it's going to be defeated by this understanding of prophecy. Right? So there's a message that's going to be victorious. And that's the message of Jephthah here in this case, which is the symbolic use of numbers, of time. But all of this is about line upon line in the end. Because without line upon line, we have no sort of anchor for our symbolic use of numbers. So I'm going to reiterate a uh, criticism that I have of what I see people doing, not just, uh, you know, not just in this movement, but in everywhere in the Bible when people use symbolic use of numbers, is that they're arbitrary. That is... They find some number and, and they find some coincidence or circumstance of numbers and they apply a interpretation to this, but they have no basis to apply interpretation because they haven't created a structure that comes from prophecy. That is, every time I analyzed a prophetic period in the Old Testament and came up with my understanding of how to to use numbers and dates and spans and so forth to analyze them. It was, it never created anything new. It was just analyzing what already existed. And so we can analyze what exists. You know, for instance, when Colin created his line, you know, making this prediction about uh, the election, right? And he didn't put the 65 days at the end as literal time. He just had the 46 and the 19 as symbols, right? That we're going to have yes. 40, 46 means we're going to have a Biden and then Trump's going to come back and he's still going to consider himself the 19th re Republican president. He's still going to be number 45, right? So he's going to also be 19. Right. But he refused to put the dates there, but we put the dates there. We put January 11th and we saw that it witnessed to the structure that we already had. And the structure that we had was based upon the week of Christ. It was based upon Millerite history. It was based upon all kinds of witnesses. And, and so I could then take Colin's date and say it's significant because it's part of the structure. And then we went through judges and we found that we could put all of these things on a line. And we're going to see that when we get to Samson, you know, much more clearly. Now, Samson is... I think the most interesting part of the book of Judges, at least for me, just because it, it encompasses so much. It's like the line of Christ because Samson represents Christ. And, and so when we put, we put all these things together, we can get a picture of, of what the significance of these dates are. The one thing we're shown is we can't predict events and, and we shouldn't speculate on events. We shouldn't say, Time will tell about dates with some kind of speculation about them, even though it could be tempting to do so, right? We need to recognize that God has been leading us and he's teaching us certain things and nothing wrong with putting dates on a line, analyzing numbers, looking at verses, all these types of things, but they only become meaningful when they're put in the proper context structure. Okay, we cannot we cannot predict events, but can we observe patterns? 
Well, we can observe patterns, but because that's part of analysis. But those patterns need to be within the framework that was given in God's word through prophecy, through line upon line, right? Okay, but I mean, I'm, there, there is a reason I'm asking the question. I mean, when we're observing things, if, if we're looking at this in the way that it's presented from scripture and from history, yeah. if we're observing a pattern, that fits with what we have seen in in these situations and we see something of that pattern that is not yet has not yet happened is that a bad thing is that predicting something um well if you're predicting something on that date you're saying we have this date here and and i think because of these other events that happen on such and such a date or such and such a pattern that that means that date in the future is going to be connected to that in some way that i, I don't think that that's that's the correct way of looking at it now now, you can have multiple witnesses and you can start to see a structure and support it. So if we take April 5th, 2030, for instance, All right. I mean, I see this back in 2018. I dismiss it because I'm not looking that far in the future, but it is the first day of the first month. And then we're studying Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We look at Abraham's covenants. We look at the chapter numbers. We get 67,320. That's 187 prophetic years as a symbol. That's multiplying 12 times 15 times 17 times 22, the chapters in which the covenants are enacted. And, um, and then I remember, well, that's, that's 600 days short of 23 prophetic months. And so, you know, we look at that and we can say, oh, that 2300 prophetic months leads us also to the first day of the first month. April 5th, 2030, from the first day of the first month in 1844. And it happens to be in 186 years and also 187 prophetic years and 20 prophetic months. That being the extra 20 months is the 600 days, right? So, so we start to get this picture of, of this. And then we also have Ezra chapter 7 to 10. Right. We have that starting the 2300 days. And then we have that first day of the first month to the first day of the first month. And we line this up and we find that this also points to 2030, 2020 from the first day of the first month being September 11th, 2001. So we just keep having all of these things piled upon them. But we're still not making a prediction about April 5th, 2030. We're not saying it's going to be the Sunday law or Nashville is going to be hit by a nuclear attack or, or anything about that. What we know is that date witnesses to the dates that we already have, to what we already understand. And it, it gives an answer to Colin's prediction and the dates that he has, right? It shows that his, his structure fits in with that. But we can now place it on a bigger structure, and we can see that we even have the symbolic re representation from the American tax system, uh, which is, um, can't remember the number, but it was uh, an application for an extension of time or a further extension of time or something like that. And so, so we can see that God is giving this movement time. That's all we can know about it. Whether that time actually goes to April 5th, 2030 or not, we don't know. Yeah, that was the 2688. Um, and the 2688 relate, related to um, uh, the number of days, right, from that date that we had to April 5th, 2030. So, so we can understand this 
that God is showing us at this time that we have more time, that we need time in order to, um, that was from November, uh, November 24th. November, yeah, November 24th, Thanksgiving. So it was from Thanksgiving to November 5th, 2030. That's an inclusive count, 2,688 days. And, and, and that, of course, was relating back even to the November uh, uh, 22nd, 2018, 2018 um, uh, prediction, right? So, and in all of these things that we're seeking to do, we're just trying to understand what God is showing us. We're not involved in trying to speculate about what's going to happen because that's not what God's asking us to do. He's asking us to measure the time. And then when things happen, we will know that it's the time. We will know that he's, <coughs> excuse me, been leading us. But we know he's leading us as well. But he's, he's always correcting us. When we step our foot off the path, he puts it back on. He gives us light so that we can see the path as we walk with him. And so it's not a criticism of Colin or Adilio or anyone else. It's just that there are things we don't know that we need to know. And if we continue to neglect to know the things we need to know, then we will, and because God has given us this light, if we don't examine light that he's given us, and we go off track, then we are responsible for that. So anyway, we have to close here. So thanks for the discussion, everyone. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for your words in scripture, for this story of Jephthah and uh, the way that it speaks to us at the present time. We pray for each person who is studying these things. Help us to continue to investigate your word. And uh, we pray for this movement, for all the people that we uh, know that we've uh, that we have in our hearts in this movement that we have influence with. We ask, Lord, that we can be an influence for good. Uh, be with us through the rest of this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>